Welcome to Fintech Daydreaming. The podcast that dives into the world of banking technologies and the ever-changing landscape of fintech companies. We bring you real life examples from global and local thought leaders, as well as experts working within the financial industry and seek out the best stories from the front lines of financial services innovation, where dreams of industry pioneers meet reality. Hosted by Paul Krogdahl and Ville Sontu. This is Fintech Daydreaming. Hello and welcome back to Fintech Daydreaming. And I'm saying back because I, of course, assume that you're already a fan of ours and listening to us as many times as possible in the past. In case you haven't, feel free back to go uh, and listen to all the past episodes, uh, especially for this season, because uh, this season has been a great one. And uh, today uh, I am here, Vila Sointu, and I will be your host for uh, for today's conversation. And... I'm joined, as always, by my good friend and co-host and partner in non-financial crime, Paul Grugra. So, uh, Paul, how's the uh, summer coming along? I thought we agreed to keep that whole crime thing out of these podcasts. <laughs> yeah, but I, 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 did, I did say non, non-financial crime. I don't know if compliance. that's better. I mean, what is non-financial crime? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I guess it's we're the, back to stealing neighbors' apples, aren't we? Yeah, maybe it's just a criminally bad humor that we have here on the podcast. That's uh, that's uh, let's uh, leave it leave it there. But how are you, man? I'm good. I'm good. It's actually uh, uh, yes, I'm good. Uh, it's been a good season. I think we've had some fantastic guests. I'm still waiting for summer to hit us. I've heard rumors that summer is on the way, but all I've seen is torrential rain and cold weather. So. Um, <laughs> Maybe yeah. maybe the uh, the summer is, is is on its way. But talking about the uh, the season we've just had, um, it's actually been very Finnish. I don't know if you've noticed that we've had an awful lot of actually not an awful lot, but we've had quite a few guests on that were Finnish. That's true. Come mm-hmm. to think of it, uh, and uh, I'm I'm just looking back at the I'm trying to recall the episodes, but we we did have. Uh, a lot of Finnish, Finnish guests, even though we, of course, had some diversity on uh, on the board as well. Uh, I mean, the, the last episode we did was with Paul from, from Meta, mm-hmm. and I think that was uh, definitely not a Finnish person, even though, funnily enough, uh, he has some Finnish background for working for Finnish companies. But yeah, but yeah uh, you, I mean, you might be right. And that well, brings we had, us to... We had, yeah. if, if you look at it, we, we had Marcus and, and Mikko, right? We, we talked to them on two different episodes about uh, identity. Mm-hmm. Uh, sovereign identity. Uh, we had Yako from Encino join us. And if you sort of also throw into that the the whole thing we did around the, the Nordic FinTech Summit and, and sort of label that as Finnish, then um, and that sort of, it almost puts us at nearly 50% of our episodes for this season have been in one way or another Finnish. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it, uh, it does have an impact on where we are living. <laughs> So, it does. Yes. Yeah. And and to be fair, the uh, the episodes that we did on the digital identity, we did uh, and intentionally want to have a Nordic angle to it, and we wanted to bring a, a Finnish uh, Finnish a- a aspect into the uh, digital identity space because we know from from feedback from our listeners that the uh, the digital identity space, especially here in the Nordics, is fairly interesting because it's what I would consider. Uh, quite unique in the way it's been built uh, in the Nordics and how effective it is uh, from a society perspective. But just uh, to bring the uh, audience a little bit up to speed, what we're doing here with Paul today is that we're, we're, uh, we're going to summarize uh, the season we've had. And the, uh, the reason why we're doing this right now is, of course, that this will be the last episode of this season uh, before we're heading out uh, for our well-deserved uh, summer breaks and uh, as always, we, uh, we we intend to end uh, end our seasons with uh, with summarizing the uh, what we've learned uh, and all the all the fun mistakes we've done and all the fun we've had during the season. And uh, we're going to do that uh, in form of a conversation between me me and Paul. So uh, unfortunately, dear listeners, there, there's not going to be an interesting guest today, but you will get to hear us uh, going back and forth and uh, recall, uh, recalling some of the uh, some of the uh, guests that we've had uh, over the season. 
But before we continue this interesting discussion and, uh, and anecdotes uh, from, from season five, uh, we of course have to have our uh, joke uh, here uh, in mm -hmm. the beginning, because since I I'm officially hosting... I think we need yeah, to do jokes. Today. Yeah, that's true. We're kind of co hosting today. So we're going to do two dot jokes. So we're going to do one in the beginning by me. And then in the end, Paul, as always, you will do yours uh, in the end. So to keep things balanced, and uh, we will not surprise the audience uh, too much, at least uh, with this one. So uh, I, I, I have a very particularly bad joke uh, today, uh, and I, uh, as, as much as I enjoy puns, this was, uh, well, quite bad, but because it's bad, we do bad jokes here, we're gonna, I'm just going to go with it. So Paul, um, what did the nut say uh, when uh, it was robbing a bank? I have no idea, Villa. What did the nut say? Give me all the cash you, you have. Tough. We're scraping the bottom of the barrel, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are. We're really getting low on these ones. But uh, luckily, it's the end of the season. We can refresh uh, or replenish the uh, the stock of jokes that we have, uh, because the fintech world is moving forward. I'm sure we're going to find some good stuff on Twitter uh, quite soon as well. And based on, of course, our own experiences, we're going to develop some of the, some jokes perhaps ourselves as well. Do you think we should continue having the guests uh, share their the jokes, or should we go back to us? Doing the jokes. What do you think? I think we can do. I think we can do a bit of both. I think some of the some of the uh, the guests are really uh, keen on sharing their jokes, and then maybe sometimes uh, when it's not that clear from the from the guests that they want to do it, then we can do it ourselves, of course. Yeah. And um, I think uh, I think that works well because the uh, the guests they always bring their own color from wherever they are from, uh, and the uh, the jokes tend to be a little bit uh, maybe different uh, from from what we always do. At least, so uh, we're going to keep that part of the uh, uh, part of the uh, structure here. Now, one thing that we always do at the end of the season, is, as we summarize these things, is that we all uh, we also want to understand what worked and what did not work uh, during the, this season in order for us to be better uh, mm -hmm. next season. So, uh, I'm going to use this opportunity to uh, ask the audience that uh, if there's something you really liked uh, about this season uh, in particular, and if you saw something that we could improve, and even if you have just a new idea of, of a thing that we could do or quest types of questions we could ask from, from our or from our guests, uh, please feel free to uh, get in touch uh, with us. Uh, you will find us on all the socials uh, and as always uh, on all the podcast platforms. We are very easy to find uh, and reach. Uh, feedback is always appreciated. But uh, as we expect that feedback to come from you, dear, dear listeners, we also, of course, during the summer, we're going to have uh, maybe some uh, cold beers with, uh, in the sun with, uh, with Paul, and we're going to brainstorm uh, what we're going to do better and maybe a little bit different uh, next season as well. But uh, Paul, I mean, do you think we, uh, what were the kind of uh, major lessons learned uh, from this season, if any? I think we did most of our lessons learned in, in earlier seasons. I feel like we've now, we've got a format that works. We've got a structure that works. Um, I still think that, you know, we're finding interesting mix of, of guests between um, uh, well-known industry thought leaders and, and some more obscure ones that come with fantastic, interesting point of views. I mean, we had, we had the fantastic discussion with Tony around uh, RegTech, right? So, mm. and um, so I, I, I don't think as such, I would say I've got any lessons learned. What I would say, though, is I'd like to do more uh, events. I really enjoyed uh, the, um, the episode we did from the, the Nordic FinTech Summit. Um, I think we've got an agreement with, uh, with them that we'll do it again next year as well. But um, that I really enjoyed. It was a little bit more work for us. Uh, I really struggled with the editing and the audio and stuff afterwards, but that was actually that was good and and i'd love for us to try and get the ability to do more uh live events or, or corporate events i mean we've done a few with nordea um in the past i think those have been fun and those we should try and do more of 
Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think uh, it was the most memorable uh, episode for me, at least this season, because it was so different. Yeah, we did li live uh, live interviews and all of that fun stuff. So the downside, of course, is that during that week, I got COVID uh, somewhere. I'm not sure if I got it from, from that specific event or was it the Finnovate one that I came from uh, joining you there in the uh, in the uh, Nordic FinTech Summit. But uh, again, uh, the COVID aspect aside, I think it was a, it was a great week uh, meeting a lot of people uh, in, in this uh, conference environment and uh, making a fun episode. I think that was uh, really uh, uh, appreciated by the organizers uh, and uh, we definitely enjoyed doing it. And that's actually an interesting thing. Well, we've been running this podcast almost entirely during the, the pandemic and different levels of lockdown. Uh, and uh, I think what we for the events like the corporate ones that we've done for Nordea, I think we're going to see now as, uh, as hopefully the society will remain open even after the summer, uh, we will have the chance to have these uh, physical uh, uh, recordings of, uh, of Fintech Daydreaming. And uh, I'm really looking forward to bringing in some guests and even maybe panel discussions, uh, almost, almost like a roundtable discussion that we could record and facilitate for, for these uh, corporate events or even public events uh, if possible at all. And I, I think this live angle, or at least live recording, uh, is definitely something that uh, I'd like to explore more. I hope we get the chance to do that. Uh, certainly, we're going to do that for the FinTech Summit again uh, next year. Uh, but I'm hoping, of course, that during autumn, we will get to do more uh, more as well. It's always fun to do stuff uh, live, especially if, uh, when the... Yeah, when things go wrong, uh, hilariously wrong, uh, and then uh, then you can keep that on the on the episode. It's always uh, fun to be, uh, make a little bit of fun of yourself as well. We could always also, you know, take a look at this this whole new LinkedIn Live capability as well. I don't know if that's something worth doing. And we have discussed frequently about whether we should try and actually have the physical get together between you and I and a, and a guest in in a studio to record episodes. But we, we need to look at that. I mean, one we've got COVID still to a certain degree. That's the cost of doing it. And then most of our guests. I was about to say most of our guests are not based in Finland, but we started this episode off by saying almost 50% of our, our season five was we finish guests, but maybe we should consider that as well. I don't, I don't know whether the media or of us being all together would change the dynamic at all. Yeah, we, we will experiment for yeah. sure. Uh, as, as, as long as the opportunity cost is not uh, not too high, like you mentioned, of course, we have to uh, be sure that uh, we all remain and our guests remain safe, uh, where, whatever we're doing in the future as well. But uh, on to actual in topics of uh, related to fintech, I think what we what I wanted to do uh, for this discussion today is to maybe summarize a little bit what were the main themes that we saw uh, during this season, maybe uh, compared to uh, uh, previous seasons and what, what are the new things we learned about and did we find any commonalities between the guests. And uh, I've picked up three, uh, three different topics here that I think we, we should maybe discuss and uh, reflect around uh, how our different guests had, had what views or points of view they had around the topic. And the number one on my list, of course, is the thing we actually discussed in the last episode as well, and that's the metaverse. Yeah. I think we uh, we talked at least in three or four episodes. We we touched upon the topic of, of the metaverse uh, and uh, and learned uh, a lot about well at least about the fact that well there's a lot of different perspectives into what the metaverse is and what does it actually mean from a technology and, and, and fintech standpoint. And uh, while well, we covered a lot of uh, uh, a lot of this uh, thinking in the in the last episode with Paul as well, but uh, I mean. From from your your side, I mean, we've had these discussions. So, what's where are you? Where do you stand today uh, in metaverse uh, in context of uh, financial technology? Still early days. I mean, let, let's be honest. Um, unlike a lot of other trends, um, we've seen money poured into this. I think way too early before anything really has been realized visualized properly um, the money has just flown in which means that investment has come before uh, innovation almost um, so i think we're going to see a backlash but i think we're going to see a growth i think metaverse is going to happen it's it's just a case of in what form and what form factor and uh, those sort of things um, i think there's still a lot of discussion of people confusing between web free and metaverse and and how the two connect together 
Um, there's still lots of discussions around, you know, digital assets, cryptocurrencies, uh, blockchains, and how all of these things will will finally come together. But I think it is the the culmination of all of these things together, which is going to drive the the foundational shift for us. Um, how is it going to affect banking and finance? Uh, I I think still to be seen. Um, there is still lots of discussions around. Uh, the death of banks and uh, the focus on on um, tokenomics, uh, etc. I don't think we're ever going to see fiat currency disappearing. I, I think um, you know fiat is here to stay, predominantly because the regulators and the banks will keep it that way, and I think society will want to keep it that way. But I think there is going to be other forms of value as well going forwards. Um, but I don't think that I, I definitely don't believe that I will be having my salary in the future, near future anyway, paid in NFTs or um, or cryptocurrencies. I mean, what do you think? Yeah, well, or even soul bound tokens, which uh, seems to be the <laughs> yes, exactly cool, cool, yeah. cool in, in brackets uh, term that it gets thrown around these days. Uh, and I'm sure we're going to talk about SBTs uh, in the uh, in the next season, uh, maybe not today. But uh, on the question of uh, on, on crypto and all of this, uh, well, whether fiat is going to continue to exist in the metaverse, I, I completely agree. As long as we're going to have nation states, we're going to continue to have fiat currencies because that's pretty much, they're very, very tightly connected. Uh, it is very hard to see fiat currencies being uh, re replaced by any kind of non-sovereign uh, method of exchange without disrupting the society uh, in a much bigger way. And I, th I don't think that these uh, breakdowns in the society is what anybody really wants, uh, even though they might be talking a big game every now and then. But the uh, the metaverse question, I think, has evolved in my mind, even during this now six months we've been of, this, uh, of this season of, uh, of uh, our podcast here. So if we uh, look at the basic definition of, of the metaverse, um, the way it was introduced to the broader public by, uh, by dear Mark Zuckerberg and, uh, and his funny videos about 3D characters in, the, in virtual reality. Without legs. That's the way, yeah, so that's the, way, that's the way most people see it. So if you mention a metaverse, people start thinking about VR goggles that you strap on your head and uh, then you go to this virtual environment to, uh, to, do, to do the things you do. But in my mind, as we've discussed even with several guests on this on this podcast, is that this is much, 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 actually much more than that. It is the broader understanding of the digital environments that where we connect to. So uh, you could, some people even argue that, uh, the, that the Zoom meeting like this or a Teams meeting that we're having is, uh, is one way of connecting uh, in digital means in the metaverse. So we are kind of meeting in a virtual space. Yeah. That is an oversimplification in my mind, but the, uh, but the broader thinking of metaverse has evolved in my mind to be that it's it's everything the digital world around us where we uh where we it's an extension of our physical lives uh, it is the uh all the iot sensors the digital twins that we're going to have in the future it's the uh this uh all the data streams where we connect to all the information around us where we connect to in different ways those ways today are things like social media they're like zoom meetings like this and they, they are uh, we are connecting to our uh, home automation uh, we're uh, connecting to game worlds where we are uh, playing uh, through our uh, TVs and uh, and maybe even those VR goggles. We are connecting to these digital environments. The broader context always is that there is another world, uh, another world which is defined by digital technology that we have. We are increasingly getting a glimpse into uh, through these narrow windows today. But it's as as we this starts to expand, it also starts to connect and interoperate. And suddenly, before we know it, we might be in a world where we have this almost like, a, and I'm going to sound like a really sci-fi geek now, a parallel universe <laughs> that is defined by um, by digital worlds. And I think that's that's the metaverse. I think it's too narrow to say that it's a, it's a virtual reality or extended or augmented reality. It is the digital overlay uh, on the world around us. Uh, and uh, it might, might uh, diverge or it might be tightly connected uh, to the world around us. Time will tell. I but also think another thing that's quite important when we talk about the metaverse is the fact that it's, it, it's ongoing. Um, am I explaining that correctly? I mean, if, if you think about 
uh, old notions of, of internet and games. Whenever you, you left the game, the game stopped, right? Whereas with the metaverse, uh, the fact that you disconnect, step out, uh, turn off your goggles, whatever the case is, everything else continues, right? It's just you that depart from that instance, uh, but everything else continues to evolve uh, without you there. Absolutely. And again, these digital worlds, these games, like you mentioned, they have been mostly disconnected from the world around us. And uh, I think the metaverse is, is bringing it closer to, to you, your identity and yourself and how it is a, really a, an extension of your, of your life in that, in that world, in that digital world. And uh, I think these connections, these bridges between our day-to-day -day lives and these digital worlds is, is going to be an interesting thing to define. And one of these bridges, of course, as we know, is the integration to the financial infrastructure and ownership structures and legal structures uh, of the world around us. And uh, this is actually where I think the uh, my view differs a little bit from uh, from the Web3 advocates or the, uh, the crypto advocates. And, and that's that I think the... Uh, the banking world uh, or the financial systems and ownership definitions and digital assets are going to be defined by regulated institutions, even in the metaverse. We had a guest, uh, I think it was Chris Skinner, who mentioned that uh, in, in the second life digital world, uh, which is sometimes some old, some a little bit old right now, even there, they did have the Linden dollar uh, ecosystem, which ultimately then uh, after a few <laughs> turns of events, they had to say establish that uh, in order for you to provide financial services in the second life, uh, you need to be a regulated bank. Yeah. So even they came down to that conclusion. And I think that's while that might be a little bit uh, old fashioned way of thinking, uh, it is an indication of, of the way the metaverse is also going to get integrated. So I think believing that this uh, virtual uh, worlds require a completely disconnected virtual financial system like the, uh, like the crypto ecosystem is today, I don't think that is going to be true. Uh, I think the, uh, the 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 new forms of regulation, the new forms of licenses, and, and embedded trust that uh, the licensing institutions and properly regulated institutions can do in the future is going to be the key uh, to really unlocking the uh, the value ecosystem in the in the metaverse. And you mentioned you mentioned something at the beginning of of our little chat here, but also um, halfway through what you're talking about, and that's identity. And I think, like we said at the beginning, we, we, we had two episodes around sovereign identity, around identity management, digital identity. And I think that's another thing that we're going to see a, a fundamental growth and focus on going forwards, not only in, in here in the Nordics, but I think globally. Uh, and I think it's going to be connected to the metaverse. It's going to be connected to Web3. It, it's going to be a fundamental infrastructure that we are going to require to be able to move forwards. And that's going to connect as well to the regulated organizations like the banks and, and governments and financial institutions and everything. Um, and how we therefore manage our identity, but also data about ourselves. I mean, I think GDPR is going to evolve. I think there's going to be an awful lot of things in the next couple of years happening in this space, fundamentally. I mean, David Birch, we had him on as a guest, admittedly, last season. Um, but I mean, he he's very, very uh, opinionated on this and says that identity is the new money, almost. Yeah. Yeah, you. I mean, you. You just picked up uh, the second thing on my list, which was digital identity, a very big theme for us. Uh, obviously, for this season, we have two dedicated episodes for that, as, as we mentioned before. And uh, I'm. I'm <laughs> it's funny you brought up uh, Dave Birch because that's that's always the first person I think about when we start talking about identity, because he's been going off about the uh, the, the the necessity to have properly modular. Uh, identity and contextual identity in the digital worlds for a long time yeah. and uh, uh, they always I always remember when we talk about payments and what is the context of uh, identity in payments I always remember that this is from Dave as well which is that the uh, payments equals accounting plus identity I think that that is a very concrete way of saying that, uh, well, actually identity is mandatory for you to actually do value transfer that is connected to the society and the value uh, structures around you. Without that identity piece, you will always remain somewhat uh, disconnected from the, uh, from, the, from, from the mundane world. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, uh, 
identity in the especially uh, in the we just talked about the metaverse i think that's going to be an also interesting battleground not only on the uh, on the what type of payments and, and financial systems you're going to build in the metaverse all of that the first step in that world will be uh, the question of how you bring uh, actual uh, strong identity uh, into this uh, into these metaverses yes one, yeah yeah and one thing i also want to emphasize here is that when we talk about bringing in uh, the the identity, your your kind of true strong identity, it does not mean that you have to be in these metaverses with your own name. And again, I'm always coming back to Dave Birch on this. He always talks about that. Well, I can be whoever I want in these worlds, but behind that structure, there can be a strong identity which guarantees that I'm first of all a real person. I'm of uh, of, of legal drinking age if that's required, uh, or uh, again, and I have somewhat of a reputation. You don't need to reveal any of those facts. You can be, I don't know, a uh, John Smith or John Doe, uh, if you want to be in these metaverses, and the other side doesn't need to know anything more about you than that name, that alias that you're bringing, uh, bringing to the table. But at the same time, they can see this almost like this verified mark in one way or the other, however, that might be displayed in these future worlds. But they can be certain that there is a real person behind this, uh, and there is a reputation uh, behind this person. And again, that's not necessary to, to be revealed what those things are. I think this kind of cornerstone to build these new types of trust relationships uh, with complete privacy, if necessary, or if required, uh, is the key to unlocking a lot of value, uh, not only in the metaverses, but also in the financial system uh, from a broader standpoint. But I also then, I mean, it relies back to the fact that there has to be a uh, authoritative organization that actually guarantees that you are you to start with. I mean, if we think about the infrastructure is already there, you can you can log in with Apple ID as a good example, right? If, if you download on your iPhone an app, you can say you want to you want to authenticate and log in with your Apple ID rather than creating an account, which means that Apple is verifying to the the uh, the app that you are you without actually passing on any of your information. Um, and, and to a certain degree, when we log into public service uh, services here in Finland using our bank credentials. We're doing roughly the same thing, right? The bank is is standing behind saying Villa is Villa, and we guarantee that he's Villa because he has authenticated with us. Which to me means for that to really work, you need to have some regulated entity that is going to manage uh, your identity, right? Yes, and I think this is actually bridges to the one of the discussions we had uh, with Marcos, especially uh, on the uh, on the self sovereign identity uh, principles that are building building being built right now, uh, especially here in in Europe. And we we already see like things like EIDAS two regulation and the European Union digital identity scheme being developed. Uh, we can always discuss whether the details of that implementation is going going exactly the way it should be. But um, but in principle, this uh, self sovereign uh, principle of where the government, just like they issue your passport today, uh, they are the ones who are effectively keeping the records of you as a as a citizen of a certain country. They are the ones who hold the keys, uh, very literally hold the keys to your core identity uh, as a citizen of a country, a uh, citizen of a European Union. They obviously should be the one uh, who issue this core identity, this core credential uh, of who you are and uh, where you're from and where you were born, all these important things that they already know about you. But beyond that, I think once you have this anchor, uh, your identity anchor defined, then you should be able to control from a wallet or any type of uh, control mechanism that you want to define, uh, you should be able to use that credential to sign anything you, you need to sign without revealing any pieces of your identity uh, or even relying on a, on a single centralized uh, uh, entity to do that. For, for example, if I have this core credential that I'm able to control, just like I would have a passport in my hand, uh, but a digital version of that, now I could use that to prove facts about myself. Now I could go to my bank, for example, to request that, can you give me uh, a credential saying that uh, my credit history has been flawless for the past five years? The bank would probably be happy to do that uh, if, if it's regulatory possible. Uh, first of all, uh, I know there's a lot of laws around this, uh, around different kind of credit scores, but still, let's assume for a second that 
we could do that from a legal standpoint. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, even asking for a small price uh, for, for them to issue that type of credential. Because now I can take my identity, I can take my credit worthiness, and I can go to another financial institution and say, hey, look, here's my, uh, here's my credential. And then that institution can, can go and verify that credential. And you don't even need to uh, disclose which bank you got it from because the bank who is actually accepting that credential can trust that the network and the cryptography uh, around this uh, credential guarantees that this is an authentic uh, credential that can be legally val validated if necessary. Yeah. And this building, this network uh, is a multi-faceted uh, process where you need to have collaboration on, on, on national and international and regional level at the very least to make this happen. And that by, in, its, in the way it will get built, it becomes sufficiently decentralized, I would say. So rather than you being uh, completely dependent on a single single entity to, uh, to issue or uh, run your wallet or anything like this, you would have always the choice on how do you want to mix and match these things and always as an individual remain in control of, of the way your data, your credentials, your information gets shared. And I think these types of things, this work that is now happening uh, in a lot of places will be the first steps yeah. in the, towards that vision uh, that Dave Birch has uh, defined for the, even for the metaverse, where I can be there and the, my counterpart in the metaverse, whoever I'm interacting with, can be certain that uh, I'm, a, I'm a legit person and uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a citizen of a certain region without knowing anything more about me, uh, uh, unless, of course, I explicitly want to disclose that information to the counterpart. So, yeah, so long story short, I think we've, we've covered some of these topics in, the, in this season of the, uh, uh, of the podcast, and I think this is we're in a critical moment in time when, when these uh, things are being defined uh, in early stages, and we're going to see the results of this in the next uh, three to four years, uh, and it's going to be an interesting journey. No, I agree. I agree 100%. Yeah. Okay. Indeed. Good. Uh, then the third common theme, which, and again, this is maybe a little bit drier <laughs> than the metaverse, but uh, still, of course, has to be mentioned. And that is the emergence uh, of, uh, of this cloud core banking and banking as a service uh, yes. in, the, in the fintech space. It's been, it's been a really uh, common theme. And I think we first kind of realized and mentioned this in the podcast in, in the live episode we did in the fintech summit, because we realized that many of the uh, uh, vendors uh, exhibiting in the, in the fintech summit were, uh, there's a large part of them were banking as a service or cloud core banking vendors, something that was not necessarily true, especially uh, pre-pandemic. So, uh, I mean, Paul, I know you work a lot with these uh, co cloud core banking uh, vendors and, and customers using uh, infrastructures like this. Uh, so what do you think about this trend? Is it got kind of going over already? Are we seeing too many players in this, uh, in this uh, space? Or, and uh, what do you think is going to happen next? I think we're going to have, we're going to see mergers, acquisitions. I think we're going to see that. Um, it's like a normal trend. We're seeing a bubble growing. Um, I think there is a, a continued growth visible when it comes to, you know, embedded finance, when it comes to um, banking as a service capabilities being uh, made available to, to non uh, regulated uh, entities or, or non-banking organizations. Um, I think we're going to continue seeing a growth of that. I mean, this whole idea of, of invisible banking, um, you know, where we no longer consciously think about how we do some of our banking. Um, prime example, I mean, we all know this, you, you, don't, you don't consciously pay for your Uber ride, right? You just get out of the taxi and it happens. And, and I think we're going to see more of that. And to enable a lot of this, uh, I think we're going to see a growth of um, cloud enabled, cloud native capabilities uh, because it just makes it easier from an infrastructure perspective and from a, a platform based economy going forwards. But I also think that we're going to, I mean, if you ask me, I don't think we're going to see large tier one banks any day soon saying, I'm going to move the core onto the cloud. Uh, cloud native, yeah, absolutely. But I think it's still going to be 
to a certain degree on premise, you know, within their own, own control. Uh, I mean, you work at Nordea. I don't see Nordea in the near future saying I'm going to move my core banking out into to a public cloud environment. Um, smaller banks, uh, community banks, uh, etc. Possibly, yes, I can see the benefit in doing that. Um, so I think we're going to see a growth of that. So I think the winners, if we look at the the platform providers um, are going to be the ones that still have the capability to deploy cloud native capabilities on premise uh, for banks, as well as deliver capabilities in a software as a service model or a public cloud uh, deployment. Um, I can understand why a lot of cloud providers, or sorry, core banking providers are also looking at creating offerings which are SaaS, uh, software as a service capabilities, um, banking as a platform capabilities, because the, the scale is easier, right? It's, it's easier to, uh, to drive a multi-tenant capability. Um, it's easier to manage to a certain degree. Uh, and you can change some of the um, some of the ways that you manage the uh, transactional cost associated with it, um, rather than these large traditional upfront uh, license models that we used to have. So I think we're going to continue seeing a growth. But I mean, let's be honest. Um, most banks have not even moved more than about eight percent of workloads to public cloud. So I think we still have a long way to go before mission critical workloads are, are moved to public cloud. Yeah. That's yeah. my, but I mean, you're, you're sitting in a bank currently, right? <laughs> so um, you, you probably can, can agree or disagree with me seeing from the bank's perspective. Yeah, you, you said currently foreshadowing, stay tuned. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so yes, uh, I think it's interesting because I, I think one of the many of, one of the maybe first episodes we ever did for FinTech Daydreaming was we talked about moving into the cloud and, and cloud banking. And uh, there's and this discussion has been going on for a long time. I think that the move to the cloud uh, for banks is going to take a long time. And I think that all the way to the public cloud, well, we'll see if that, that ever happens. I think there needs to be some uh, rethinking around uh, the supervision and, and regulation around data uh, management uh, in particular before the, the whole public cloud conversation can be uh, thoroughly uh, clarified, especially for the incumbent banks with critical uh, positions in the society. But nonetheless, we've seen a lot happening already. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the infrastructure, even in my bank, uh, is, is quite interesting compared to just what it was five years ago when I joined the bank. Uh, a lot of things are more are ha already happening in the cloud. Most of the new development that we're seeing is happening to one way in one way or another in cloud type infrastructures, whether those are hybrid or uh, or even public clouds uh, in, in certain cases. So so yeah, uh, it's it's as always the uh, the move is uh, slow, but it's uh, it's inevitable. Yeah. One, one other uh, aspect of this uh, cloud core and uh, banking as a service discussion I'm really looking forward to in the next coming years is basically just clarity on what we're really talking about. Because, because well, I think we, we've had uh, three different vendors uh, this, seasons, uh, this season uh, as guests. So we, we started with, uh, with Bankable, uh, who is a banking as a service provider with, uh, with a certain kind of ways of looking at the, uh, the stack. Then we had, of course, uh, Encino. So we had Jaco from Encino after the uh, after the live episode uh, to talk about what Encino is doing in this space. Again, a bit of a different approach. And then we had Yobota uh, again with a completely different approach. However, if you take the category of banking as a service, you will you will be able to talk to all of those three vendors, but have a very different outcome out of those conversations. So again, in the same way as, as things like the metaverse is looking for a good definition on how can we talk about the same topic if we're talking about a, a headline called metaverse. Mm -hmm. I think the same will go for banking as a service. I think the next year or two, uh, there's going to be more clarity around uh, what are the different categories for stack providers and technology and service providers in licensed and unlicensed models uh, and what they can bring to the table. Right now, it's, it's a little bit, uh, takes a little bit of research to kind of get to the bottom of, uh, of different kinds of offerings. But that's, I guess, 
just an indication of the diversity of different players in this space mm -hmm. and, the, and the overall interest in, in making things like this happen. I, I take already now a fairly strong perspective view on this. I mean, I define banking as a service as being um, delivered by a licensed organization because you're delivering banking capabilities to a third party and the license is a fundamental element of that banking as a service paradigm. Without the license, you're not delivering banking as a service. In my view, you're there moving into banking as a platform. You're delivering the technology capabilities to enable a licensed organization to operate banking capabilities and, and services in a as a service uh, paradigm. So to me, banking as a service, unless there is a licensed entity behind it, it is not banking as a service. And I'm happy to have our listeners shout back at me, but uh, and, until someone else comes along and really, really convinces me otherwise, banking as a service has to have a licensed entity. Yeah, true. But then there is also a question of that, how is that licensed entity connected to the stack? So like we, we talked to Bankable, so they have partner banks in regions and they're able to kind of act as a proxy for a licensed institution, but they themselves are not regulated like a bank. So it, it's a package deal where you make the relationships. Yeah, but it's almost like a turnkey way of getting in there. And they, they can argue that that is banking as a service. It doesn't matter that we ourselves are not a regulated institution. Uh, so I, I yeah. So, like I, th I think, there, Villa, you, you're agreeing with me and I'm agreeing with you. It's One is about the definition of what is banking as a service. The other one is around what's the construct you're using for delivering it. Yeah. Right? So for, from, from that perspective, yes, I mean, Bankable is a banking as a platform provider, but they partner with licensed organizations to deliver banking as a service capabilities. The discussion goes on and... Uh, yeah. I, I, <laughs> Definitely looking forward to the long line of banking as a service providers uh, now coming to our podcast as guests to explain why their model is the, is the true banking exactly. as a service. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so welcome. Please get in touch. Uh, we would love to have you on as a guest and have the debate as always uh, we do on the podcast. But uh, I think, Paul, I mean, we covered a lot of ground. We talked about what we've had over the season, and I think we covered most of the uh, big themes. One of the things we did not talk about it was uh, central bank digital currencies, but I think that, that conversation will go on for a long time. And I think in next season, we're going to have some interesting developments more, uh, coming from, from, uh, from that side of things as well, as projects like e uh, the ECB's digital euro is starting to come to maturity in terms of design. Uh, so we'll, we're going to be talking a lot about that. So that's uh, kind of a three plus one topic uh, for, for this uh, themes of this season, but we will leave the most of that uh, for, for next season. Yes, but we're also running out of time, as always. Exactly. So the, uh, as, uh, as we say, uh, time, time flies when you're having fun. And uh, we, of course, cannot leave you, dear listeners, without, uh, without a uh, banking-related joke from Paul, like we, like we uh, forecasted in the beginning uh, of this episode. So, uh, Paul, do, do you have a joke? Hopefully it's uh, as bad as mine. I do have a joke. It actually isn't banking related at all. I'm sorry. It is, oh, okay. it, is, it is the second time that one of my children have said that they had a fantastic joke that they really wanted me to share on the podcast. So, I mean, the last time I believed that it actually was banking related, this time it is not banking related at all. Uh, but it is a good, bad joke. Um, and it's maybe a little bit risky. So, so I hope we're not going to get hit by, you know, obscenities and everything. <laughs> You know, so, but, but Villa. Yes. Why don't you ever see elephants hiding in a tree? I don't know. Because they're bloody good at it. <laughs> but Villa, I wonder, yep. why do elephants paint their testicles red? Uh, I have a guess, but I think you, you have the right answer for me. So that they can hide in cherry trees. And I'm wondering, Villa, do you know what is the loudest sound in the jungle? Nope, please tell me. Giraffes eating cherries. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, uh, let's see if we get the little E thing in the <laughs> episode because of that. But uh, yeah, thank you, Paul. I, I, I actually enjoyed that. <laughs> Nothing to do with banking, but, you know, yeah, it sets us off for a happy mood of the summer. Yeah, exactly. And just be careful, dear listeners, when you're out there picking the cherries. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> and uh, and especially the uh, the elephants that are really good at hiding it seems <laughs> but, but uh, yeah uh, again maybe that's a good segue to uh, moving on to our summer break uh, maybe get our minds off uh, fintech for one second at least before we start preparing for next season of fintech daydreaming mm-hmm. after the summer but uh, like we foreshadowed uh, in the episode already uh, I do have a bit of a personal announcement to make and this might be interesting for our listeners and that is that this is the last episode of fintech daydream that i will be doing uh, working for nordea bank yes. so uh, after five years almost exactly five years of uh, of working uh, at this uh, great nordic bank uh, nordea uh, i have decided to to take the next step in my career and uh, I've actually kept the, a little bit uh, in, in secret about where I'm actually going, uh, but now I'm going to use this platform as a way to announce uh, that that my uh, my next employer is actually going to be my former employer. So I'm going back to Ericsson Financial Services, where I, where I will be working on emerging market uh, banking products, uh, financial services platform products uh, in a, on a global scale. I'm really looking forward to uh, contributing to the growth uh, and success story of of Ericsson's mobile financial services unit. And I think there is a really bright future ahead. Uh, I'm really looking forward to working with the the team again. There is amazing technical talent and capabilities in the organization that I I truly respect. And uh, I think it's going to be an interesting journey. So this will not change anything uh, for uh, for our podcast. We will continue as as we always have, and hopefully maybe bring in some new perspectives again uh, as I move back to a more global role instead of this regional one that I had with Nordea Bank. Congratulations, Lila. Thank you. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, it's, uh, it's a really interesting challenge and uh, gives me... Uh, the ability to build something tangible uh, that will have an impact in the, in the society. I hope, at least, at least the challenge is there in front of me for me to, for me to accept and uh, succeed upon. Yeah. But with that bombshell, uh, like the like so they say in some shows, uh, I think it's time to end uh, this week's episode uh, of of Fair fintech daydreaming. I'm not going to ask Paul to tell uh, where uh, they can reach out because everybody knows where you can find us already. Or the only thing I'm going to ask is to leave a review. Please click that five-star review in the, on the platform that you're listening to or watching this right now. Uh, leave a like, leave a comment, leave a review. Uh, the algorithms uh, love them, but we love them even more uh, because that gives us a, a connection to our audience uh, and, of course, helps others find this uh, podcast that uh, that might be interesting for, for fintech crowds, uh, at least. Yeah. So with that being said, I wish all of our listeners a great summertime and I will, uh, we will see you again uh, on season six of Fintech Daydreaming in a few months time. Thank you. Goodbye. And this has been Fintech Daydreaming. This is Fintech Daydreaming. <laughs>